Welcome back to Thursday Night Fly Tying. Um, next week will be open topic. Uh, but tonight um, is something I wanted to do for a long time. Uh, this fly will never go viral on Instagram, but it's probably one of the most important flies ever created. It wasn't designed to stand out to fishermen, but uh, more importantly, what the trout sees underwater. Um, I'm going to go to the fly. Oops. So this is the uh, Gary LaFontaine's um, deep sparkle pupa. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, Gary LaFontaine grew up in Connecticut and studied behavioral psychology in 1963 at University of Montana. Of course, uh, he scheduled his classes around um, fishing. Um, but um, over the years, he authorized he authored um, several books. Uh, Challenge of the Trout in 1976. Um, Caddis Flies is probably, uh, to this day, one of the most influential books um, ever written in, in fly tying, fly fishing. Um, that was in 1981. The Dry Fly New Angles was in 1990. Trout Flies Proven Patterns in 1993. And in 1998, he did uh, Fly Fishing the Mountain Lakes, Summer of Discovery Series, Volume 1. And sadly, he didn't get to Volume 2 or 3. Um, he passed away in January of, 20, of 2002 from Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, like I said, it, he may not go down in history as one of the best fly tires by Instagram standards. But I think he was... Uh, one of the best fly designers of all time. He approached everything scientifically. He really focused on what the actual insects look like, but not like most fly tires who sane the water or pump stomachs and tie flies to mimic what they look like to us out of the water. He spent time underwater uh, watching trout eat naturals and actually watched them take artificial flies. And he designed his flies to mimic what a trout is attracted to. He did a really a, a lot of study on on what attracts trout to, to eat. Um, the La, Fon La Fontaine theory of attraction is about how the color, brightness, and profile of a fly affect whether or not it'll a trout will take it. Um, the theory suggests that fly patterns that match the color of surrounding light will be more intensely colored. To the fish's eyes because they absorb more light and intensely colored flies are going to attract trout. So when surrounding trees and vegetation are green, then a fly should have green in it to be the most visible. When rocks, rock cliffs or fall leaves or are predominantly like reds and oranges, you should have a select a fly that contains more orange hues. For uh, caddis flies, um, the larvae spend their lives hidden in cases or under rocks. Most of them do. There's there's several species of caddis flies, but um, it's it's a complete metamorphosis. So they go from egg to larva to pupa and then to adult. Um, but the larva, um, obviously, the eggs stage isn't significant. The larva stage isn't really either, in my opinion, because in most cases, they uh, spend their lives hidden in cases or under rocks. Um, the adults, uh, skipping ahead a lot, uh, the adults actually spend very little time on the water, on the surface. And when they do, they're often fluttering or skating across the surface, and they're not an easy food source. Um, so, um, during a caddis hatch, uh, and that can be kind of confusing, um, during a caddis hatch, a lot of the rise forms are likely to be eating emergers instead of the actual adult insects. And throw in one uh, 
example um, in Boise, actually, uh, the Boise River, I saw just a huge cloud of all these, uh, you know, I didn't know at the time what they were, but these little moths and turned out to be caddis. Um, they were everywhere. And um, I did see some, some fish rising, but um, I tried every dry fly that I had. And most of it was mayflies because that was when I first learned how to tie flies. Uh, I learned on, on dry flies. Uh, I tried to make them kind of look like, you know, tried to, you know, clip their wings and stuff like that and tried to get anything. I couldn't get anything on the surface. I ended up, uh, the only rainbow I caught was on uh, a woolly worm, actually. Just trying everything I had in my box. But then I kind of started reading about what was going on and I learned about caddis flies. Um, but one thing I learned is that a lot of times you'll see a huge cloud of caddis flies over a river and there's really not a lot of surface action. And, and the reason is a lot of times they'll, they'll hatch out of the water um, and they spend, as opposed to mayflies that might live about one to two days as an adult, caddis flies can live uh, a few weeks sometimes, um, but they'll spend a lot of time uh, you know, migrating up and down the river um, in big clouds of uh, of insects. And so people see all the insects flying around and think it was a big hatch and it, they could just be migrating up or downstream. Um, so the key is that, you know, a lot of times, even though you see them in the air, a lot of the rise forms are likely to be the emerging insects because that's, um, as Gary referred to it as uh, being the the best time to actually fish caddis imitations. Um, to me, that's the stage that's the longest period of time that the tr trout actually has access to them. Again, I talked about the the larvae that are e either in cases, kind of like a um, you can kind of equal that to a like a butterfly's cocoon. Um, they stay in a little um, case underwater. Uh, clinging to rocks or or underneath rocks, um, but it's that stage where they break out of that um, sheath, and then they start to turn into that lar that uh, pupil stage, where they um, start to metamorph metamorphosize or whatever into the adult. Um, so they'll drift along the bottom, as the one that you're looking at right there. They'll drift along the bottom. And uh, as a newly forming pupa, and they'll their uh, outer skin is going to start to split, and uh, they build up gas within there, and uh, gas bubbles, and that's what allows them to rise toward the surface. And as they rise toward the surface, their wings will start coming out, and then the next fly we're going to um, cover is the emerging um, pupa. And that's where the wings start to form a little bit, and that rides in the surface film. So that's right there is the is the probably the most um, as as fish that eat caddis flies. That's probably you know ninety percent of their caddis fly diet. Um, he refers to it as two points of hesitation. One is when the larva leaves case and drifts along the bottom, and then the other is as it sits in the surface film waiting to form into that adult that can fly away. Um, so that's why he basically designed two separate flies that are very similar. If you're interested in further reading, um, other than the, the book Caddis Flies, um, there's a very informative tribute book, um, La Fontaine's Legacy and uh, written by Alan Gretchen. And uh, other that, I mean, it, it does talk about the uh, sparkle pupa. They have a bead version in there, um, but they also cr created an instructional film with Par Paul and Char Simps Stimson that's currently being converted and made it available on the internet. So, um, 
they do cover a lot of Gary's flies. Um, so, um, Al, did you want to give any other uh, insight into um, Gary or uh, anything else on this pattern? No, Before he would just started? just that, just that he was a very unique individual with an in, incredible sense of humor. That if he started a story and he said, "Now, guys, this is mostly true," you knew you were in for a roll on the floor with a belly laugh. And that's, uh, and I would say at least fifty percent of his stories was mostly true. He was a very special fellow. I met him. What a lot of people don't know is when Gary moved to Montana, he moved to Deer Lodge, and that's what. In fact, it was in Deer Lodge where he wrote several of his books. But he was a clinical psychologist and worked at the Montana State Mental Present uh, Mental Hospital in uh, Warm Springs, which is 14 miles from Deer Lodge. Well, about a quarter of a mile from the hospital where he would get off work was the Upper Clark Fork River, about as good a fly, dry fly fishing as you could find in the state of Montana, and not very many people knew about it. And, and that's how I met Gary. And I had his book, Caddis Flies, and I was fishing there in the late 80s. I don't know, let's just say... 87 or 88, I don't remember. It was somewhere towards the latter 80s. And um, there's this guy walked up and he says, hey, man, how's it going? And I said, good. Yeah, he said, I'm just getting off work. I thought I'd go out and fish a bit. What's your name? I said, I'm, I'm Al BD. He says, I'm Gary. Hey, how's it going? See you later. And on down the river he went, never thinking that it was Gary LaFontaine <laughs> until I was a featured warm-up speaker for the featured speaker at a, at a fly fishing event. Gary LaFontaine, boy, I was just delighted to learn that I was going to meet Gary LaFontaine because I really was uh, and taken by his flies and so forth. And anyway, I walked up to the head table to meet Gary and here's the Gary from the river on Deer Lodge. He never had given me his last name, but he remembered. The guy had a memory like you wouldn't believe. Besides telling stories that were mostly true, he had a memory that it up up until his death, he could remember intricate things from way back. But anyway, I've taken enough of your time, Mike. I'll let you get back to it. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, Al. Appreciate it. Let me <clears throat> move the spotlight. Um, I think I, I think this was his quote um, that I read somewhere. He said, uh, "If you if you fish if you fish the wrong fly." Um, hard enough and long enough, eventually it'll become the right fly. Um, but that's kind of just the the way he took everything. Um, in this other book, I have a uh, history of fly fishing and 50 flies. Um, I looked to see if there was anything by him in there, and all they really gave was a quote about caddis flies. It says, a sad fact of modern fly fishing is that so much of the lore is geared toward one insect, mayflies. That the special the typical angler has difficulty adapting his methods to the feeding that occurs during a caddis fly hatch. He's conditioned to fish his flies to simulate the typical habits of a mayfly, not a caddis fly. And so really I think uh the the book Caddis Flies, I think, really brought you know fly fishermen to really uh start to respect and 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 fish um fish during caddis hatch. Um, it was little understood. And so um, all the work that he did really helped people to understand it. Um, so I'm gonna start with the um, deep sparkle pupa. And today um, you can find a lot of, uh, <laughs> there's so many variations of, um, you'll see a lot of deep sparkle pupas that have deer hair on them. Um, deer hair and beads, um, lead wire and beads. Um, but when the book first came out and when he first started uh, doing these, the deep sparkle pupa was um, just like uh, like I showed here where um, it's just soft tackle, uh, the antron that we'll, we'll talk about, uh, some dubbing, and it represents uh, that, that pupa that 
is starting to break out of its nymph out of its uh, shuck. And uh, so it forms a gas bubble and that's what allows it to rise toward the surface. Um, and then the, um, it's a, a soft, a speckled soft hackle normally for the, for the legs there. And that just represents the, uh, the legs of the insect. Um, for the materials, uh, well, let me go back. Let me go to the, I have a PowerPoint here. Just, I'll only be a little bit longer here with blab and then we'll go actually to tie in the fly. So um, the caddis larva, like I said, uh, there's a lot of flies that represent that. Um, but um, actually there's, there's a couple species that just kind of free ride around the bottom, but for the most part, these are hidden um, in cases and under rocks, but it's the caddis pupa that's the most vulnerable stage of the insect. And that's as it um, forms into that adult insect. So the legs, the wings, and all of that starts to break out of that nymphal um, shell before it becomes the adult. Um, so this is a um, picture of the, like a cased caddis, where th that's where that nymph is inside that shell. Now they will eat these um, if they're drifting in the, in the current, but most of the time these are clinging to rocks or debris or logs. Um, uh, whoop, let me go back. The uh, That's what the uh, actual caddis nymph looks like. And again, with little rocks attached to webbing, um, that's what they look like. And here's an example of uh, how they can cling to rocks and they can be huge clusters of them. Some of these are probably already hatched out and they just crawled out of the shell. Um, here's another type uh, that's more uh, rectangular. Um, probably using grass and sticks to build the, the cocoons, if you will. Um, some of them actually form very uh, intricate rectangular cases, and there's a cluster of them as well. Um, the actual um, pupa, there's a lot of flies, like, uh, like I was saying, a lot of times uh, people will use a little screen to kind of sane insects out of the um, surface or out of the, out of the water and then they'll look at that and they'll represent they'll create a fly that represents that how that looks um, here's a couple examples of different things but um, what Gary did was he he created flies that look like how they look underwater as they're actually rising to the surface and then he tested these flies and he would say that um, he could watch a trout go a foot and a half to the left, foot and a half to the right, selecting uh, different insects. But when you when he put the the finished, um, you know, sparkled pupa out there, they would come from several feet away to just nail that fly. And so that's something that really triggered them to say, "This is definitely what I'm looking for, and uh, definitely what I want to eat." Um, so for the first one I'm going to tie, it's a standard dry fly hook. Uh, you could use a, a wet fly hook if you want to give it a little more weight to sink down. Um, you could also, um, it, it's kind of hard to make this sparse and add some lead. Uh, but again, uh, after the book Caddis Flies came out, uh, beads started to become more popular. And so um, Gary did... Uh, by a few um, versions with a bead. I watched a video where um, he used to say that he couldn't tie that <clears throat> darn fly. Um, he, his daughter uh, actually did the one with the, uh, the version with the bead, his daughter, Heather. And uh, you could tell the way that uh, she tied it was the way I had seen him tie it um, in older videos. Uh, Almost, almost to a T, except for adding the bead to it. Um, the tail uh, on the deep sparkle pupa, it, you're normally not breaking free from the shock when they're down deep, uh, but you could clip a few yarn fibers uh, to form a trailing shock. 
Uh, the legs are um, a speckled hackle. It could be a uh, partridge or any speckled. Um, I have some, uh, I think it's Coctelion um, hen hackle from Whiting that's a uh, really good uh, modeled um, hackle that I'm going to use for the legs. Uh, the body is, um, as, as we'll describe, it's a um, antron and fur mix for the for the dubbing, but then there's a bubble of antron over the top, and then the head is brown dubbing or uh, wrapped marabou. So I'll stop sharing and switch to materials. So for the first one, I lost a little focus here. Um, we're not going to use the deer hair. That'll be for the second one. Um, the yarn, um, if you want to uh, purchase the closest um, version of what uh, what these were originally tied with, um, if you look for, uh, if, you, if you have something to write down, on, and I'll send this out on an email if anybody wants it. But it's lure frat lure flash antron body, body wool. Lure flash antron body wool. Um, at the time there was uh different yarns that were it's an antron, and sure you can use um I have some antron uh you can buy antron yarn, but as a rule, uh to me that seems like it's very coarse. Um, a lot bigger in diameter of the of the strands than than what's in this yarn, um, and you really don't need a lot of it uh, as as we'll get to when we tie the fly. Um, for the uh, body, uh, I think I've touched on this a little bit last year, but we'll do touch dubbing. Um, to me, it's easier than. Uh, a lot of other kinds of dubbing. Uh, but for the head, we'll actually twist it on a little bit tighter. Uh, so I'll use green for the body and, and this brown for the head. Um, and then I'll use um, BT's dubbing wax, the tacky, um, to do that touch dubbing method. So I'll switch back to the Fly. Put on my glasses, and I'm going to do this in a size 14. Uh, I had a lot of size 14 hooks. I would say um, 12 to 18. You could probably, if you're adventurous, you could probably try to do this in a 20. Um, for the thread, I have some olive in this uh, Semper fly. Um, you could use an eight-aught olive thread if you wanted. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so we can see a little bit more. And I'm going to start my thread. Um, for this first one, I'm going to be... Um, you don't see a lot of people doing this. This is a Tim Flagler trick on um, making the bubble and making it consistent every time you tie this fly. If you're, um, say you want to tie these commercially or you just want them to all look the same, um, this is something where you're in there poking and prodding and everything. And in order to get that bubble the same every time, uh, this is a pretty good trick. So what I did was I started my thread about a, a third of the way back from the eye and wrapped it back to the to the bend of the hook. I'm going to take some of this yarn, and it's actually three strands. I'm going to cut just a card length. It was about maybe an inch and a half. And out even further here. 
I'm going to take this yarn and, and separate the plies. There's three of them in here. So I've got one here. I'll set that down. Separate these other two. So I've got three, three separate strands here. First thing I'm going to actually tie in is the bubble. I'm going to actually take my scissors and just clip off that end just to make it nice and clean. And come forward to that one third point. I'm going to tie this in. Now, the way Gary did it was he tied the first one in on the top. And then the second one, he started on the, on the top, but he let thread torque take it around to the bottom. So you had one of these on top, one on the bottom. Um, I've also seen it um, where you just kind of do left and right. I'll do the far side here. So if I zoom in, I've got this strand of yarn is on the far side. Now, I'm going to take this yarn and actually starting out here toward the end, I'm going to start to separate it because I want this to be frayed and you'll see some of it come out and you just want to kind of hang on to that because we'll use that on can the you next back block. out just a little bit mike so we can yeah. see what you're doing. sorry yeah i'm i'm further down the strand thank you john i'm basically basically trying to um fan this out and you can also take a comb and just try to spread that out. So that's pretty, that's pretty spread out. Any of this fuzz that comes out of that, um, this is a pretty soft and sensitive um, antron. You can see it's, it's very fine strands. Um, you can hang on to that. You can use that for uh, trailing shock or um, to mix into some dubbing. So now I'm going to take another strand of the same stuff out of the three and I'm going to put this on the side closest to me. Around the shank of the hook, I've got that, that yarn um, combed out to where it should pretty much be 360 around the hook. So now I'm gonna come forward a little bit and turn my hook. I wanna do some touch dubbing now. So now I'm gonna really have to zoom out. And like you can see everything there. I'm gonna take my dubbing wax here, um, tacky. And you wanna, Raise this to where it's barely breaking the surface of that um, tube. If you um, have it sticking out too far, then you put the wax on too heavy and you end up with a big mess and big clumps of, of wax. But you just want to kind of make sure that <clears throat> that wax is coated with that tacky wax. The thread is coated with the tacky wax your cap on. Now for the underbody, I want to make this um, kind of a green color. It was funny that a lot of the um, flies that I saw Gary tie, it was a tan or a cream colored um, uh, the yarn that he tied on for the for the shuck for the bubble. And for the underbody, he would also use just about the same color. So basically, I'm just taking this dubbing. This is Touchatron um, dubbing. This is a lime color. And what this is, is very short fibers. It's not like, uh, you know, when you look at the super fine or some of those other things, it's real long fibers. This is maybe a quarter of an inch um, fibers of Antron mixed with 
some fur and then dyed to the specific color. But I'm basically just gonna touch this on there and the, the wax will take as much dubbing as it wants to hold. So you can see that it's real sparse. And now- Mike, is that dubbing a BT product? Yes, BTs. Okay. Um, you can buy this, I'll, I'll show you the website here in a little bit. BT's blend, this is Touchitron. There's also Soft Touch. And uh, there's one other uh, blend, one other type of dubbing. So the reason I kind of went out here toward um, a little ways toward the hook point is I'm not getting dubbing all the way up toward the top of my thread. But by the time I wrap this back to the bend, now my dubbing is starting right back there at the back. And now I'll just take this and wrap forward. And I'm, I'm not twisting it on. I'm just taking that, just touching it on and then wrapping it. And you can see it's a sparse body that's real buggy. Um, I'm going to wrap that all the way forward to that one third point. Actually, a little bit farther than that, about a quarter. But I want to keep that hook shank bare right up there. So now I've got the underbody. So now I want to start taking this Antron for the bubble. And I want to spread it around. Pull it forward, and I want to make sure underneath and on all the sides, I have pretty good coverage. And here it looks like I need to kind of spread that out a little bit more. I think I've got a little heavy right here. Just want to fan this out where it's real frizzy like that, and then pull it forward. And then I've got a pretty good coverage all the way around there. So actually, I skipped a step. I want to take my thread and in loose wraps, I want to go toward the eye of the hook. I'm going to pull this Antron back for a second, do loose wraps toward the eye of the hook. Actually, I want to spin my thread so it's corded up because it's starting to come apart. I want to wrap toward the eye of the hook. Then I want to fold this forward, form the bubble, but I'm going to pull it tight over the eye like this. Okay. Now at the eye, I'm going to go ahead and make a couple turns, probably three or four turns. And then using the yarn that's left over here and my thread, I'm gonna scoot it back like that. And what that does is it inflates that bubble. So now I've got that bubble inflated. And if I need to increase it a little bit, I can take my dubbing needle and tweak it some. I can spread this around a little bit. Can you zoom in a bit closer, Mike? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so when I, when I scooted that back, what that did, since I spiraled it toward the eye and tied it in at the eye, then when I pulled the thread and the and the yarn back, what that did was it inflated that bubble. And then I can kind of come in here and stretch it out a little bit if I want. What that does is it creates a, a sparse bubble here with the underbody showing through just slightly. And when that gets wet, that's going to look just like that um, pupa emerging from that shock. So I'm going to go ahead and cut the rest of that loose. I can use that for the next fly. And then make sure that's tied down good. Now the next thing I'm going to do is take, like I said, I had a uh, speckled feather here. I'm going to take uh, 
up nine or five barbs off of that rachis. Bunch them together and tie that in underneath. To form the legs. And then I'll cut those butts away. And then we'll go back to dubbing. Put some wax on there about two inches. Take some of this brown. Now an alternative to uh, this front part is to use um, marabou and wrap it in. But now um, I'm gonna go ahead and take this and twist it on because the, as um, Gary said, he observed the, the head portion of the um, caddis pupa is a lot more op opaque. So this isn't something that he would use the uh, touch dub for. So just take that dubbing and make a dubbed head there. And then we'll whip finish. And that's the deep sparkle. Now this is also done uh, if you have a, uh, say you have a soft tackle that has uh, fairly short barbs, you can go ahead and wrap a collar. Um, but the way uh, Gary tied these was either partridge or another speckled hen um, down as a beard like that for the legs. But uh, these are also often tied with a hackle collar right behind that brown head. So Any questions on the deep? Either, Go ahead. Mike, either, you or, either you or Al, how would you fish this? And when so, would you fish it? So the key is, um, let's say you go to uh, a certain river and you talk to the local fly shop and they say that uh, around two o'clock in the afternoon, there's a, a pretty strong caddis hatch. Uh, you'd probably want to start this about noon, you know, say 11 or noon and start um, fishing these, uh, the deep pupa um, or the emergent pupa. And um, the, the key is that um, this is what they see most often. And this is the most accessible during a hatch is while these are emerging from the surface, using that bubble to float to the surface. And uh, so if you know there's gonna be a caddis hatch at two o'clock, I'd be fishing these at 12, 12, 30, one o'clock and probably clean up before there's any dry flies, uh, before there's any adults uh, showing themselves on the surface. Al, I don't know if you have anything from guiding or whatever that you might have to add. One of the things that works really well too with the deep sparkle, uh, you're 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 dead on as far as what you're what you're doing. You know, down in the down in the thing, do the drift. Don't forget though to let the thing swing and come up in the current and hang below you for about um, for a few minutes not a few minutes, maybe 30 seconds, and then drop a couple of three more feet in and let it drop downstream a little bit and then come to another stop. I can't tell you how many fish I have caught after I've let it drop downstream. Just just as a tip on the on the fishing side of it, 
on the other side of it, uh, are, are you doing the bore on the surface next, Mike, or are you going deep? The uh, emergent next. The emergent, okay, yeah. yeah. The emergent version is a, a great way to fish that, that son of a gun. It's just like you were fishing any dry fly, trying to get a good a good drift on it right in the surface film. And um, but below it, you don't want it up on on top, and uh, it's just just like you're fishing a, just like you're fishing any other emerger, uh, and uh, if you get to the dry fly version of it, um, uh, I'll give you a tip. What you want to do is put a really really heavy fly out on the end of a six foot tippet, and come up about three foot to four foot, and add a dropper and put your your dry fly on that. And cast out into the current and then lift your rod tip so that you're pulling against that heavy weight weighted fly out in the current but you're bringing the dry fly up off of the water bounce it up and down on the water like the actual caddis fly does when they're laying eggs up down up down up down drift a little bit up and that's what that's what you do is that, that up and down on the water will drive the fish absolutely nuts Sorry wow. for stealing your thunder there, Mike. Let me get out of here. Uh, actually, you gave me a lot of thunder with that one. Really appreciate your insight. All right. For the next one, we're actually going to add that deer hair. And for this one, I'll I'll use the marabou for the head as well. Although that would probably be better suited for the deep. Um, get this one out. And I'll put in another. Here's the... Uh, Here's the emergent sparkle pupa. So you'll notice the difference on this. It's got a um, same head, same body, same underbody, um, but it's got a deer hair wing. And then uh, normally the emergent has a little bit of uh, antron hanging off the back to kind of represent the shuck that it's coming out of, that it's shedding or whatever. So this is the pattern sheet for it. Um, again, pretty much uh, the same materials. The only addition is uh, deer hair wing and then actually clipping some of the um, yarn fibers to form the trailing shock. Same hook, size 14. Uh, I would definitely use a dry fly hook on this uh, pattern. Again, it's, a, it's an emerger, so you want it to uh, be able to ride in that surface film. And I already moved the deer hair, but um, this is some stimulator deer hair, hair from Nature Spirit. Um, it doesn't really matter because you don't have a whole lot on there, um, but it's a good wing material. Um, so that's what I'll use. I'll start the thread. Um, this is that real slick uh, Semperfly nano silk, so it takes it a while to get the Red started sometime. I'm next time I buy some fly tying materials, I'm going to get some thread wax. It's different than dubbing wax. Um, probably some of the same materials, but it's a it's a hard wax, and uh, on a slick thread like this, you just basically rub the um, the wax on the thread, and it helps it grip a lot better. A lot of the English fly tires use that for silk back in the um, day. Mike, I'm sorry to bother you, but on a local basis, one of the best things you can get for that thread, uh, for the thread wax, not, not for dubbing wax, but for thread wax, is go to the hardware store and get a toilet ring that's used for in the wax ring right, that are used right. for installing toilets. Great yep. stuff. Huh. Thank you. All right. So basically go the same route. Um, the the key that uh, you know Gary has seen a lot of uh, people tying his flies and he says a lot of the ones that you see tied commercially are way um, they're they're not sparse enough um, the key is to make them sparse and this is from the guy that uh, laid on the bottom of the river and watched the <laughs> K-1 
caddis take or not take certain flies. Um, so I'm going to tie that in nice and tight and then come forward to dub my body. You don't see a lot of flies nowadays that use the um, touch dubbing. Uh, there are a few. Um, but again, Gary, who studied the patterns of trout and uh, studied what they look at, what they like and don't like, a lot of his flies use this, this method. A lot of Al's flies use this method. Um, so I'm going to work this back toward the back. And start wrapping it forward. I do like it with a little bit of color contrast. Like I said, a lot of the ones that uh, Gary did are like a light tan with a cream shuck. And you wonder how they can actually see that body through there, but I think between the hook shank and that material um, that's on there, I think that gives the representation that he's looking for. I've got that combed out pretty good and So I'm going to spread it around. Wrap my thread forward, spiraled. Right to the eye. And then I'll wrap it forward like this. Trying to get all those going forward. And then I'll look around. It looks like that's pretty well covered. So at the eye of the hook, I'll make three or four thread wraps like that. And then using the thread on the bottom and the yarn on the top, I'll scoot it back like that. And that inflates the bubble. If you do it that way, then every one of these flies you tie is going to look the same. I got that bubble with the green on the inside. And then I'll just make a couple wraps over and under just to make sure that's secured. Cut that off. Tie down those ends. Now, on top here, it's a little thicker and that's okay. So I'm gonna come here toward the front of the fly, reach in there and just make a little clip and pull those back. Just kind of twist them a little bit just to make sure they gather. And that again is supposed to be sparse and that represents the trailing shock. Meaning the, um, the shell that that insect's actually crawling out of. Um, there is no beard for the emergent. Um, so at this point we tie in the wing. Um, you'll never see, I don't think you'll ever see uh, Gary LaFontaine use a hair stacker. Um, I think I actually saw a video where he was saying hair stacker. <laughs> if you look at the wing of a caddis fly, if you look at the wing, it's all jagged on the edge. So why would I use a hair stacker to represent that wing? Um, so I'll grab a bunch of deer hair. 
strip out all the short hairs and under fur. So you use a comb to just kind of take all that nasty stuff out. And then I go about halfway down the shock. I'm going to lean that a little bit towards me. And then go ahead and tie it down. I don't want it to be flared too much, but I do want a little bit. So right there at the end, I'll just kind of give it a medium tug, but make it make sure it's nice and tight up here toward the front. And then I'll clip that free. And now, again, for the emergent, I'd probably use the dubbing. Um, but just to show you this technique, um, I can take a zoom out a little bit here. Take a marabou plume and just grab about nine or five of these fibers here. Pull the rachis away from them. And then I'm going to, okay, see how the string wants to reach toward the front? I'm going to spin it counterclockwise. And then it'll reach back toward my fingers and grab those tips. Take a couple wraps and then pull them back some. A couple more wraps back. And then I'm going to get those tips out of the way. Now some nice tight wraps back toward the eye. Now I'm going to take these, this marabou, and just give it a little bit of a twist. But as you wrap forward, the little... Um, Flues that hang off of those um, fibers there give it kind of a shaggy dubbed appearance. A couple wraps over the top, and then a few wraps in front. Oop. A few more wraps in front. Cut that loose and whip finish. That's the emergent sparkle pipa. Any questions?